are the one who deserves all the glory, all the honor, all the worship, all the praise. And so in this place, Holy Spirit, we honor you. In this place, we worship you. In this place, we wait for you. In this place, we're touched by you. In this place, we're changed because of you. And Holy Spirit, in this place, Lord, we receive our marching orders. And so, Lord, today in this place, we ask that you would continue to speak to us. Continue to move, continue to minister, continue to do what you do best. To change us and mold us and shape us that we might go from this place and build the kingdom of God. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this place. Holy Spirit, I ask that you give us ears to hear for the future, for what's to come. Lord God, may we respond to it, respond to your word, and, and, and we ask this in your mighty name, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, in just a few minutes, we're going to go right into communion. But before we do, I'm going to ask you to turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And uh, you ever prepared for something? I mean, really prepared for something. Maybe it was a meal. Maybe it was something bigger than that. But you were in a place of preparation. Last year, we did this corporate fast here at Trinity, and it was a time where we fasted and prayed in preparation for the outpouring that was coming in April. And this year, we're going to do that again. That fast begins next Sunday, March 13th. It's going to take place for 40 days. We're asking the church to fast and pray and fast in different ways. You don't have to just fast food. You can fast uh, other areas of your life, media. We had people fast uh, sleep last year. We had people fast all kinds of different ways for food. And, and we're going to ask you to fast with us because we're preparing. We're preparing our hearts. We're preparing our church. We're preparing this place for what God wants to do. Next week, Pastor Troy's going to come and he's going to preach a message and he's going to uh, prepare us and, and prep us for the fast and he's going to give us some marching orders in regard to, uh, to how we should be praying as a corporate body. But today, I want us to begin to prep. In, March, or in Luke chapter 22, it says this, in verse 1, now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching. There was this festival approaching called the Passover. If you don't know what the Passover was, it was a time when the Jews would celebrate. They still celebrate this. A time when they would celebrate what God had done when they were in Egypt and they were under slavery and the, Moses had come to the people and he had said, we're going to get out of here. God's preparing us to get out of here. And Pharaoh had, had said, there's no way I'm going to let my, these people go. There's no way I'm going to let these Israelites leave Egypt. And, and, and so Moses told him that God was preparing these plagues and these plagues were coming. And one plague after another began to plague Egypt. And in the last plague, the last one, the very last one, was this plague against the firstborn, where God was going to send the angel of death, and it was going to come, and he was going to move across the land and take the firstborns. And God had given special instructions to the Israelites. He said, that what you need to do is you need to take the, this lamb, and you need to sacrifice this lamb. And you take the blood of the lamb, and you put it over your doorpost. And then you're going to eat the lamb this specific way. And God said, when you do this, when the angel comes, the angel of death comes, he passes through the land. When he sees the blood over the doorpost, he'll pass by your home and spare your home. And so they did that. All across the Egyptians' homes was heard weeping as they woke up that morning to find their firstborn dead. And, and there was rejoicing in Israel because theirs had been spared. And so for years, they've celebrated this Passover, and it comes to pass in Luke chapter 22 that the Passover is coming and this special festival is coming and the Israelites would gather in Jerusalem. It was the only place where you were to 
celebrate the Passover. And so in verse 2 it says, And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. You know, I just sense the Lord was saying that the, God is stirring something amongst the body of Christ, something that Jesus is wanting to do. It's something that we will celebrate, but it's something that we need to prepare for. And God is saying there are some, even in the body of Christ, who don't like what Jesus is doing. And they're going to try and put a stop to it. And they're going to try and stop it. They're going to try and kill it. And here's the thing. This is, watch what happens here in Luke chapter 22. It says in verse 3, Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. Iscariot. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. You know, we personally need to go into a time of preparation. And the Lord showed me this. He said that there are some of us who need to prepare our own personal hearts because the greatest way to put an end to what Jesus is wanting to do through your life and in the ministry of the church is, is to put an end to what Jesus is wanting to do with your life in the private. You see, the priests were afraid of the people in public, the crowds of people, how they would respond if they tried to put an end to what Jesus was doing. And I think most of us would, would, would admit that we wouldn't want to stop what Jesus was doing in the crowds of people. But the reality is we're all too good at stopping what Jesus is doing when nobody is watching. When nobody's around in the private of our home, in the private, when we're all by ourselves, we are really good at putting an end to what Jesus is doing. And the Lord is saying that this is we need to prepare in the private place for what God is wanting to do in the public place. God is getting ready to do something in public, and if the church isn't ready for it and prepared for it in private, it's going to put an end to what Jesus is wanting to do. So this plan begins to take place in verse 6. Uh, this betrayal of Jesus is going to take place. And in verse 7 it says this. Then came the day of, the, of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and make preparation for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied in verse 10, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? I like what it says in Mark. In Mark's version of this story, he says, Jesus told the, uh, Peter and John to go, and he said, When you find the man and you go to his house you're to ask him this where is my guest room where is my guest room that has been pre prepared for me and my disciples over these 40 days can I encourage you to prepare God's guest room in your heart I continue to listen to Pastor Nathan Morris as he's been preaching on the upper room He's been preaching on this, this, this message, and it just so resonates that God is wanting a place in your heart and not just any place. He wants the upper room of your heart. That he wants the place that's designated for the master of the home. That God is wanting to sit on that place. He wants to rest in that place. He wants to be present in that place of your heart. Notice what Jesus said here. He said, you go, you go find a man. He's going to lead you to a home. When you get to that place, you find the master of that home, and you say to him, where is my upper room? Where is my guest room that's been prepared for me for the Passover? Where's the guest room? And in verse 12, Jesus says this. He says, he will show you a large room upstairs. 
all furnished, make preparations there. Is that not a, I, I wrote in my Bible right there, really big, all caps letters, awesome. Awesome. You know why I wrote that? Because I just thought it was an incredible thing that God had placed this person in such a place, in such a time, with a jar of water to lead the disciples to a place where the Lord was going to, the Lord was going to celebrate the Passover in his home. And not just in any place in his home, in a large upper room designated for this moment. This man had prepared his home, prepared his heart for what God was going to do. We need to do the same. We need to take our hearts and prepare them for what God is about to do in the next season. And I'm going to encourage you to take a large portion of your heart and prepare a large place for the Lord. Don't just take a small guest room and make a small place for Him. Take a, the biggest room of your heart, the biggest, greatest place of your heart, and prepare it for the Lord. And notice it says, and that room was furnished. It was furnished. Betsy and I just got this new home, and we are slowly moving stuff in and prepping this house and getting it ready and putting furniture in the right place. And I spent a lot of hours in one room just moving furniture around, trying to figure out exactly where it was best placed. And, and, and she spent countless hours putting dishes in the right cupboards and then moving them around to see which ones, you know, wh where the best place is for those dishes. And why are we doing that? Because we're getting ready to host people. Host our family, host visitors, host people from the church, host what God wants to do in our home. And I'm going to encourage you that your heart needs to be the same way, that you need to make preparations to host the presence of God. There's things that need to be adjusted and moved around in the heart, in your heart. There's things that need to be removed and taken out. There's some things that just plain need to be taken to the trash. You know, in this preparation time, the Lord was showing me that there, there's things in your heart that just need to be gone. Things that just need to be gone. The other night, uh, Betsy and the pastors had gone to the district pastor's uh, wife's event, and they went away for the evening on Friday evening, and uh, 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 Becky and Bobby were gracious enough, took our kids so I could get a bunch of work done at the home, and they took the kids, and that night I had purpose to get a certain critter out of my house. We knew that in the garage, the garage door was broken, and so we knew that there was a raccoon that had taken residence in that house. And I don't know how long he was there, but in the garage, we had saw where he had climbed up into the rafters and chewed through the, the plywood and climbed up in there where it's nice and warm and cozy, you know, and he's, he's made residence in that place. It would be easy for us to go, you know, he's not in the actual part of the house. He's not in here. He's not bothering us. Let's just let him be. And, and, and I had left the garage open and, and done a few things in hopes that he would just kind of leave the house, you know, that we would kind of bother him enough that he would leave, that the dogs would drive him out, and they did chase him a few times. And, and I thought that would be enough, but it wasn't. He hung out. He liked it, I guess. And he stuck around. And there's areas of our lives that we allow to stick around. And we, we, we said they're not the core of our lives. They're just kind of on the outskirts of who we are. It's not a core sin. It's just something we've allowed to exist maybe in the garages of our hearts. And we don't see them very often. They're kind of hidden. In fact, they only seem to come out in the dark times or when nobody's around and nobody's looking, and so we think, ah, you know, I just, it's okay. Eventually, this area of my life will leave. This critter, this thing of darkness is going to leave. But the reality is, 
is probably not. It's made its home in the dark place of your heart, and it's time to take action. It's time that you take action. I went out in the garage, and I'm not a huge fan of this, but I got, got the live trap, and I put the live trap in the garage. I didn't want to poison the thing and watch it climb into my attic and die in there, so I thought I got to trap this. So I got the live trap, and I put it out there, and I put some pizza in there. I thought, this will get them. And I had that sucker within an hour. He liked pizza. He likes the hot and ready's, I guess. And so he got in there, and I went out there, and I was expecting, like most raccoons, this, this animal to be spitting mad and angry and attacking the cage, because they usually are that way. And I get out there, and he's calm. And he's kind of cute. He's looking at me, and I'm talking to him, and I'm like, easy, buddy. We're just going to take you far away. And I, and I expected when I reached for that cage, him to, you know, lunge or growl or something. And nothing. And there's that temptation in your life that when you're removing these things to kind of grow attached. And think to yourself, it's not really that bad. Ooh, I don't really need to put this to death. It's okay. And we take it, and, it, and, and, and you kind of bond with it. It's yours. Even though you know it's got to go. Even though you know it stinks to high heaven. Even though you know it leaves little turds in your garage, it's got to go. You got to leave this. It's got to go. And so you take it out. I took that raccoon out, and I put him in the truck, and I drove him. And so the only place I knew to let him go was here. And I thought, I'm going to let him go in the woods here. And he'll be happy, happy too. And I pulled in the parking lot, and I got out to the back, and, and I picked the cage up. He was still friendly, and I set him down. And about that time, Mike Cribbs and his wife were pulling away from the church from the time of prayer here. And they started pulling across the parking lot and should have had their phones ready to videotape what was about to take place next. I, 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 I'm looking at this cage thinking, how can I stay as far away from the door as possible to let this raccoon out of this cage? Now, I don't do this very often, so, so I don't know what I'm doing. So I set the cage down. I straddle the back end of the cage thinking that I'm going to get away from him. I lean way over the front and start to open the door. And I'm thinking... He wants to go away from me, right? I mean, he's a wild animal. Go away from me. No, no, no. He turns around, comes back up, and starts smelling my leg through the cage. I was like, buddy, go that way. Get out, get out of here. So finally I thought, okay, well, he's okay. So I open the cage, and he runs out, and he only gets to about the second row. And then he panicked. He didn't want to go over the snowbank. So he turned around ran back to me. And I panicked. I totally panicked. I did a little dance. I did a little woo, woo, woo. And he ran under my truck, which I had left the door of my truck open. So now I freak. I run to the back of the door. I, get out of here. Get out of here. And he runs towards the church. And Mike Tripp scared him with the car. And he ran back. And he went back under my truck. Then he shoots back out under my truck. Man, I thought to myself, what is wrong with this raccoon? Just leave me alone. Just go away. But that's how it is with our sin, isn't it? Sometimes it just seems to come back. Come back. And we know, it, it, you know, it, it, it carries rabies. But yet we're tempted to take it back. You know, and we, we dance around it for a while. But the Lord said, let's prepare our home and our hearts. And let's get that stuff out. It's time to get that stuff out. And watch what happens. Verse 13. It says, They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. They prepared the Passover. What happens in preparation for the Passover is you go and you find the Passover lamb. You would go and purchase it. You would take that lamb. You would then uh, uh, slaughter that lamb. And, and, and you would, then you had to prepare the meal a certain way. And everybody would do this as celebration. 
kind of like we do with our turkeys for Thanksgiving. They prepare it a certain way. And so Peter and John had gone to make preparations for the Passover. You know, in this preparation phase that we're going through, there's going to be some of you that will go through seasons of sacrifice. It's going to be a season of sacrifice. Some of you have already started. There's been things that you've grown attached to over the years that you're now sacrificing for the sake of the king. You're getting rid of things in your lives. You're, you're, you're giving up costly things. You're putting them to rest. You're, you're ending those things in your lives for a sacrifice for the king. So that the king can use you. So the king can move into the upper room. So the king can make his place at home in your heart. And then watch what happens in verse 14. And it says, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. There's no greater feeling than when Jesus begins to make his place of rest in your heart and in your life. When he begins to take up residence there. And what happens in this moment? It says in verse 15, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took, and he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. They took communion. I believe that this next season for our church is a season uh, where we begin to evangelize to the lost. I believe that the Lord is preparing your heart to be an upper room. Why? Because the next thing that God wants to do is a redeeming work in other people. God is wanting our place and our homes and our hearts to be a place that his spirit dwells so that when people encounter him, what do they encounter? They encounter real communion with God. A God who laid down his life for them, gave his blood for them, for the forgiveness of their sins. I believe that this season is going to be a season uh, of, of evangelism for the church. And we have to get ready. You have to get ready. It's a personal thing. God's saying, get ready. Get ready. Prepare. Begin to prepare. Begin to make room. Begin to clear out a room in your heart. Begin to make it a big room. Begin to get ready for God's presence to come and take over your life. Because the more that you've been longing for is when God's presence begins to use you to redeem other people back to Him. Some of you are saying, God, I want more. I've heard you say it to me personally. I want more. I don't know how to get more. I want to go back to that place where I'm encountering God. God is saying, the more for you is a season of evangelism. And I want to tell you something. If you got lost loved ones who don't know Christ, we're coming for them. If you live in a neighborhood with lost people, we're coming for them. We're coming, we're coming, we're coming because we're beginning to make room for the presence of God. The next season is a season of evangelism. The next season is a season of a lot of corn, whole, corn dinners. Corn dinners. It's going to be a great feasting. But listen, during the time of feasting, during the time of celebrating what God is doing, and during a time when you're Preparing for what God is about to do is a season when the devil would want nothing more but to come in and kill what Jesus is doing. We have to be alert. We have to be aware. We have to be on our guard. We have to be praying and fasting. So this next season, 40 days starting next Sunday, is going to be a season of prayer and fasting. We would love to have you join with us as we begin to pray and get our hearts right and begin to prepare for what God has next.
we invite the servers to come and we're going to get ready to take communion and then we'll do a couple of lighthearted things before we celebrate uh, with the fine arts students. Um, you know, if you're here in this place and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, the Bible says that God sent his one and only son to earth to live and to die for your sins. That you might be able to have relationship with the Heavenly Father. That you might be able to live this life to the fullest. That you might be able to have His peace, His comfort. That you might have the eternal reward of heaven. But most importantly, so that you can surrender your life to God. Begin to live for Him. You know, I don't know where you're at in this place. I don't know why you came this morning, but I know this much. God knows you're here, and he knows right where you're at. He knows your heart. He knows the things that hurt you. He knows the things that make you sad. He knows the things that make you happy. He knows every hair upon your head, the Bible says. Every single one. He knows you deeper than, than you even know yourself. And I know this much. If you don't know him as your personal Lord and Savior, you're missing out. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that Christ gave his, his life for you. For you. Today you can accept him as your personal Lord and Savior. It's as simple as, as in these moments as they're passing out the, the cup and, and the bread that you just take a moment and examine your own life and say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you came. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you rose again. I believe that you are God. And today I'm putting my life in your hands. Today I surrender to you. Will you forgive me of my sins? Will you come into my life? Today I'm committing to follow you and pursue you for the rest of my life. And I don't know what that, that that's going to hold, but God, I, I, I'm going to follow you to find out. And I'll tell you what, you're about to, to step into the greatest journey you've ever gone on. So I encourage you, while they're passing out the cup and the bread, to just take a moment and close your eyes and focus on you for a moment and just surrender your life to Jesus Christ. For those of us here who are already following Jesus, let's examine our own hearts and make sure that there's not dark areas in the garages of our lives that don't need to be taken care of or removed. That our hearts are right to receive. Amen? pray and the servers are going to come and we're going to take communion together. Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Jesus, for this next season that you're taking us into. God, I thank you for this season of preparation that, God, you would strengthen us to go through it. That, God, as we make the sacrifices, Lord God, that you'll be faithful to speak to us through, through it, God. That you'll show yourself, Lord God, faithful. Lord, I pray that we'll sense your love and your presence through this season. And Lord God, I, I, I'm excited about those who are going to come to know you in a personal way. I'm excited for what you're going to do next. And Lord, may we not put an end to your ministry. May we not put an end to your ministry, both publicly and privately. God, don't let us put an end to it. Help us, Lord God, to be led by your Holy Spirit.